Welcome to the Plant-Based Podcast. Did you know that plants are truly amazing? Not only can you grow them and eat them, you can also wear them, drink them, nourish your skin with them, and so much more. Let Ellen and Michael inspire you to love plants as much as they do, as they chat with the movers and shakers in this wonderful plant-based world. So, let's dig in. We all love the stories of how plants are first discovered, but have you discovered Kalanchoe yet? Flowering houseplants are making a comeback, and Kalanchoe are at the front of the queue. Colourful, long flowering, simple to grow, what more could you want? We've hooked up with the experts at Always Kalanchoe to bring you the first half of Series 5 of the Plant Based Podcast. You can find out more about these houseplants by following at Always Cal and Chewy on Instagram. Let us know where you place yours. So on today's podcast, we have renowned author Amber Edwards, and her most recent book is absolutely amazing. It's a world tour of botanical adventures, and we just have to find out more about all of these strange specimens, chance discoveries, and perhaps get the story behind many of the everyday plants that we grow in our gardens. So welcome to the podcast, Amber. I am very excited about this interview today. Me too. I can't wait. Thank you. Lovely to be here. I just, I, first of all, before you even delve into the book, I'd just like to comment on the cover. Oh. <laughs> the cover oh, of the book is astonishing. It's just know. beautiful. So, yeah, I love that. <laughs> I don't know why I hadn't ordered it yet, but I can assure you I did in the last 13 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right, on with it. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, I mean, not just the cover, but I mean, just some of the artworks. The artwork comes from the historical archive at Kew. And so it's just oh. so beautiful. It sort of takes your breath away. Uh, yeah. uh, I can't wait to delve into it more with you now. And, you know, again, thank you so much for coming here onto the podcast. And just to get the episode started, we would love to know what the inspiration was behind the Atlas in the first place. Like, how did you decide that this is what you wanted to do? Well, I mean, it's a little bit that we, um, you know, that we have this thing called the English Garden and which is known all over the world but if you look at what's in an English garden um, most of the plants aren't English at all they they come from all over the globe and if I just look out my window here um, and I can see the things you know just I can see here I've got an ace of grisium and that was first brought to this country by Ernest Wilson in in 1900. I've got a, a euphorbia, which is nice and orange, and that's euphorbia griffithii, and that came from the Himalayas, brought by Ludlow and Sheriff in 1930s. And then, you know, they're really interesting people, because not only do they find beautiful plants, like lots of primulas and there's this euphorbia, but they're really early ethnographers, and they're some of the first people to use colour photography, And in the BMI, I found these lovely old films. You know, they're one of the first people to make documentary films. So, you know, it kind of leads you in all these directions. And then looking out the window again, there are dahlias. I mean, you see all these amazing dahlias we've got in our garden come from sort of three tallish weeds in the uplands of Mexico. (laughs) <laughs> and melanchias come from the swamps of North America. Wow. And then some of these really, like, you know, plants that we take for granted, like Japanese anemones that are just coming out mm-hmm. now. Um, yeah, we think, oh, well, you know, they're a bit work a day. Maybe don't get excited about them. Mm-hmm. Until you find that uh, Robert Fortune, the man who brought tea for the great British cuppa, um, he found these things growing on grave mounds outside Canton. Wow. And suddenly they used to be more poetic, don't they? <laughs> so oh, like, it's those kind of things. I love and then it. the stories of some of the people who found these things. I mean, you know, they're just so impressive. You can't help yeah. but be impressed by their courage and their, well, their sheer grit, really, their resourcefulness. Definitely. And also, like, it's strange when you look at an English garden in inverted commas, probably the English plants in there are the minority, aren't mm. they? <laughs> because our own yeah. floor is really, really very small. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're an island that's got like four evergreens. 
<laughs> Good job. There were plant hunters who went about. It. <laughs> oh wow! I love the fact that you've got like the story behind these plants because actually I think it helps you to connect with the plant better mm. and understand you know where it's come from. And I, I, when you look in your garden, it's just like a a whole garden of history you know and you look in the garden you think oh wow this looks really lovely this is really pretty love that color that scent's amazing but like to connect with it even more is to understand the history behind it and then you kind of go wow this is so much bigger you know than we'd like ever really known so I love the fact that you put all of this into this amazing book so people can kind of understand you know where their plants have come from I I, it's, it's fascinating to me. Like, I don't have know you how you ordered your copy yet. Uh, yes, I've ordered. No, okay, yes, I've ordered my copy, but I'm not going to have it here. I'm going to have it. A uh, uh, very complicated story. Anyway, <laughs> so obviously, there's tons of different examples that are in the book, but give us a couple of examples of plants in gardens that we'd recognize very well and ones that you document in the book just give us a little snapshot if you can just to kick us off because we've got so much we want to ask you and we really want to just get indulged in plants and their history today well i just think something that is again we all take for granted um like the sweet pea we all grow hundreds Mm -hmm. of sweet peas and um, the first sweet pea seeds arrive in this country in 1699, and they're sent to a schoolmaster called Robert Uvedale. And Robert Uvedale very nearly got the sack because he was um, a bit of a slipshod um, schoolmaster um, because he spent all his time looking after his plants. And he was one of the first people to have greenhouses and grow things in, in greenhouses. But anyway, he, he did have these seeds and they were sent all over. Um, they came from a botanic garden in uh, on the outskirts of Palermo in, in Sicily. And we don't actually know whether they were grown in this garden or whether the bloke who sent them, this monk, Francisco Cupani, went out and just picked them from the hillsides because they're still growing there in the national parks around around Palermo. But, um, but you know, from this is the genesis of all, all the sweet peas we now know. But I'll tell you the, the, the plant that really amazed me, um, which is not something that's growing in our gardens, but, you know, but that thing is something we completely take for granted. Okay. Which is, the humble Brazil nut. You know, we all eat Brazil nuts at Christmas, especially nice coated in chocolate. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Here's this, here's this thing we take absolutely for granted. We've got them in our kitchens and it is the product of the most incredibly complicated ecosystem. And I was just sort of astonished when I found out about this thing. So we, we first hear about it um, from Alexander Humboldt, the, the great explorer, when he goes down um, to try and find how the Orinoco joins um, to the Amazon. So he's crashing through the jungle in uh, Colombia and they're running out of food. But happily, there are these great big trees by the side of the river that have these big nuts and, and they became an essential food stuff for them. But... Um, this kind of everyday thing is quite extraordinary. Um, these flowers can, it, it depends on a particular bee and a particular mm-hmm. orchid and a particular very sharp toothed rodent mm-hmm. to grow at all. Don't get with every ball to bits. So the flowers are pollinated by these great burly female orchid bees that are the only things that are beefy enough to push their way into these quite <laughs> stiff flowers. And the female bees will only mate with males that woo them with this particular perfume. And this perfume, <laughs> learn, learn, gentlemen, from these bees. <laughs> and this perfume is made um, from um, scented wax that the male bees gather from particular rainforest orchid species. So if these orchids aren't growing near the trees, wow. Uh, the ladies aren't interested, the bees don't mate, the flowers aren't pollinated, no nuts. So if all this happens, uh, then the flowers are pollinated, the nuts are produced. Um, and you would think, you know, the, the hard bit's done. But no, so these, these, these trees are 50, 60 metres tall, but the, the outer casings are so hard that even when they fall to the ground, they don't crack. 
So in order for the seeds, what we know as the nuts, to be dispersed, um, you need this little sharp toothed rodent, this agouti, that comes along and gnaws little holes in it and opens up the, the outer casing. But because there are too many seeds for the agouti that's quite small to eat all in one go, <laughs> it then uh, buries some for later. Yeah. And then it forgets where they are and these seeds germinate and you get the next generation of nut trees. And, and it's because this system is so complicated, as you've heard, that it's impossible to grow Brazil nuts commercially. You have to grow them within the um, rainforest com um, confines. Oh. So it's a bit like, you know, you look at the nut, the Brazil nut, with a new respect when you know that lot, don't you? Okay. So much. That's an incredible story. And wow. I mean, like, it, <laughs> it just shows how the balance is so important in the world. Mm. You know, if you take out one species, you're actually affecting so much more. Do you know what I mean? And you don't realise that the Brazil nuts, that, you know, the chocolate coated Brazil nuts that you've got <laughs> on your table, you know, what has what they've gone yeah, through they don't to get to that with point. The chocolate on at least. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Oh, so incredible. you've got it. All of this, um, you know, all of this amazing research that's gone into uh, putting this book together, you know, how long did it take you? How how much research have you had to yeah. do in order to find out all of these incredible stories about all of the plants? And also, can I add something to that question? Has it become easier over the years with the advent of the internet as well? Because I always wonder how people put books together and how, you know, how that process works. So can you give us a little snapshot, please? Well, I you know for me, the internet was completely invaluable because I started this book just a few months before lockdown. So I'd had this happy notion that I would spend lovely long days fossicking about in the <laughs> library at Kew, yeah. blowing the dust off it. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, that didn't happen. So, you know, thank goodness for the internet, because a lot of the original texts written by some of these plant explorers have been digitised. So, you know, all hail to things like um, Project Gutenberg and um, the, the um, Biodiversity Heritage Library that have digitised the, these texts. And yeah. actually that was really, you know, and it's really quite exciting. Uh, I mean, it's not something that you can do that quickly because a lot of these sort of Victorian explorers, um, you know, they, they, they come out in many volumes. They never use three short words where 47 long ones will do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it is really, it's something quite thrilling about going back to the original source material and seeing the world through their eyes. Right. So, and some of them are really good writers. I mean, someone like um, Robert Fortune in, um, and his, his tales arrive in China. They're really very funny. Frank Kingdom Ward also is very, very funny. So they're, you know, they're, they're a good read and they're exciting as well. And then, of course, the other aspect of this is uh, garden history is social history. And, you know, this is the curse, of the, the curse and the joy of the internet, isn't it? It's kind of like one thing leads to another. So, you know, you go and find out about the plants came from Japan. So that takes you to the period of um, Sakoku, you know, the period of isolation that began in the 1630s and, and lasted until the opening up of Japan in the 1850s. And you begin to read about life on Dishima Island. So all the, all the Europeans, the traders, were confined to this one island in Nagasaki Harbour, which was just 236 paces by 82 paces. And they were kept essentially under guard. And there was a bridge to the mainland which was shut at night and all the Japanese would go away. So they essentially lived in prison conditions. So it's, it, it's reading about, you know, Oh, what was it like to live there, you know, for years at a time? No. I mean, that's really interesting. And then other things like, you know, then, well, why are they there? They're there because they're representing the Dutch and the British East India companies. And you begin to find out about them. I think, my goodness, you know, these global corporations, I mean, they make Google and Facebook look like little fluffy bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> wow. really, really sort of scary uh, global conglomerations. So, yeah, I mean, the internet was brilliant <laughs> amazing yeah, how definitely. it's taking you on these kind of routes yeah, in, like in, in, in general history as well and like mm. building up the whole picture of that era and the people and and then how the plants are part of all of that you know that's yeah it must be really exciting. fun do you ever have to interview people as well how does that work is there ever like a certain person you're trying to track down that knows about this stuff or or it mostly is written down 
Um, well, um, a lot of these are historical figures that have written mm. down, but I, you know, I also had the pleasure of interviewing uh, Sue and Bledin Wynne Jones from oh, Group of oh, yeah. Modern Day Plant Hunters, mm. and actually seeing these greenhouses and what went and their woods and so on, which are full of these. Music. Oh, what's that? What's that? What's that? I've never seen one of those. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. You, I mean, you don't, you don't know which look. It's, it's absolutely astonishing. And through oh, you know, the great Roy Lancaster, um, who is has been firm friends over decades mm. with um, Mikinori Obisu, who you know the the green samurai who has brought home so many amazing plants from China, um, especially Mount Ome and Meishan. Um, so um, he sort of um, created a link there um, for me so I could um, find out what, what he'd been doing. So, uh, you know, that was really interesting. And obviously um, talking to experts at Kew who are still mm. going out plant hunting, yeah. part of the day job. They, that's what they do. Definitely. That, that brings us nicely into the modern day discoveries that I want to ask about next. So how have you noticed that introductions have kind of changed in all of those centuries? Like how, how are plants now discovered these days? Is there a marked difference to how they used to be discovered? I know there's lots and lots of different examples and situations, but what sort of trend do you notice? Well, I mean, if we go back, the, the the first generations of plant hunters were really working for two reasons. One, you know, it was either to advance the cause of science, mm -hmm. and then others were working with a commercial impetus, which was um, either to find plants of economic value, like tea, or be a benefit to the empire, or or later garden worthy plants to supply a, a burgeoning nursery trade, and um, so like the great nursery of each, for example, had collectors in the field for, what, from the 1840s up to shortly before the First World War, about 1904, something, I mean, generations of them. So, I mean, that's really not happening very much anymore um, because um, strict restrictions on the gathering of live plant material mean that most plant hunters today are either botanical tourists and all they take is photographs or, or they're scientists uh, as as the uh, people have mentioned from Kew who are engaged in programs of conservation and we've got to say I mean they do have it easier these days that they can reach their destinations in in days rather than months <laughs> and you know and whereas earlier plant explorers set off blindly into unmapped territory and there's a great story there you know our, our people today have they got google earth and gps and yeah, yeah. The experts was telling me that you know before they go out looking for stuff in in west africa you know google earth is, is the place where they start and i just simple things like they've got you know high-tech boots and lightweight clothing whereas their forebears yeah. were up the himalayas in tweeds um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but having said that you know the trials and tribulations are exactly the same which is you know the rain and the snow and the leeches and the fog and the things that bite you and um you get burnt crispy ears and you get altitude sickness and the paths are impassable or the trees are too tall to climb or, or you get there just before the thing's in flower or just after, you know, when it's too late to gather seed. And I found this lovely quote from Dan Hinckley, who, who's a great plant mm -hmm. hunter from the States, who said, um, there are innumerable times that this process is rewarding and enjoyable and then there are times when it's only rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> and he's one of the most successful plant hunters on the planet. So a lot of the plant hunters working today, as I said, are, are, are scientists. And um, so really interesting talking to people like um, um, Dr. Uh, Aaron Davis from Kew, who is the sort of world expert on coffee, and um, who's recently found a, a new coffee uh, bean, which is extremely large coffee bean and it's, it's supposed to taste very nice too and um, but the whole point of looking for for new varieties of coffee is that the commercial production of coffee is currently threatened by um some fairly fierce diseases so it's trying to widen the gene pool find some of these things that are, are lost so that you know so you can future proof coffee um crops and also maybe make an exceptionally nice cup of coffee from this new mm. thing. Um, obviously, there's 
always this sense that you know that the unknown unknowns all the plants we don't know about that may be of unknown value to us and um, it was another Q expert pointed out that a, a, a small white flowered shrub that had been found very recently I think about 2017 growing high on sandstone cliffs in in Guinea which is thought to have you know very um powerful anti-cancer properties there's a thing called kindia gangan and also in africa um i mean these incredible i mean these are sad stories of, of experts finding uh in the last couple of years i think 2019 2018 two waterfall plants and again these are these are plants i it never even occurred to me existed that they they're, they're adapted to live in the middle of these little raging torrents Wow. And um, they were only found because of um oh what do you call it, sort of ecological investigations um to do with a, a big dam project. So you know the first one, I don't know if I could pronounce it called Inverso de Crea Cucutamba, found on the Cucutamba <laughs> Falls, which That's is about the, you know, <laughs> um, but it's only found because of their, you know, they're investigating what's going to happen with this dam project, which means all, at the moment it's found, it's pretty much certain to become extinct. Wow. And um, it's pretty, pretty sad, isn't it? And um, yeah, but you know, new things, new things are found. Think of the Wallamy pine that now is in in many many gardens, and um, that was only found in 1994. Not yeah, of course. That was that's a big one, isn't it? Hello, my name's August from August Garden on Instagram, where I share all my tips and colourful inspiration on growing your own food and flowers. I am also the founder of The Seed Explorers, which is a box of growing magic for kids. What I want to talk to you today about is one of my absolute favourites. Now, I generally say this on a daily basis about all vegetables, that they're my favourite, but they're all my favourite for different reasons. And this particular part of my vegetable garden is something I grow year on year. And I don't know anybody that doesn't have it in their store cupboard or in their fridge at all times of the year. Yes, you have guessed it. It is that wonderful ingredient, garlic. Now, I grow two different varieties. So it can be a little bit confusing when you start looking into the wonderful world of garlic because you have a soft neck and you have a hard neck. And I grow both and I grow them for two different reasons. Now, the soft neck stores best and I store mine throughout the year and probably have it in my cupboard for nine months. And then the hard neck doesn't store so well, but you get these incredible scapes. Now, anybody that doesn't know what a garlic scape is, it's a kind of like a flower sprout. And you pick that sprout when you see that flower head coming, take it off, and then you can pop that into stir fries. And what it reminds me of is the texture of asparagus, but with that slightly beautiful taste of garlic in it. And it only happens once a year. So they're part of my prized possessions when I'm growing garlic. Um, but the, the hard neck doesn't store as well as that soft neck, which is why I grow both. So this is the perfect time of year to start beginning to think about planting your garlic in the garden. Super easy to grow. And at the moment, there's not that much to be putting in your vegetable patch. So that's why another reason that I love garlic so much. So you plant it, not the same as onions, where onions, you would have them sticking out the top. You plant that just below the surface and it will see you right the way through until next year. And it's so lovely looking out of the window, seeing those beautiful green shoots sprouting out of the soil when there's not much else around. Um, the other thing I like to do is replant last year's garlic. So the garlic that I harvested this year in a roughly about June, July time, I will take the biggest, fattest cloves from that harvest and plant them 
in the next few weeks, throughout October up to about November. Um, and the bigger the clove, the bigger garlic you will get. So, you know, if you plant those tiddly ones that are in the middle of your garlics, then you will probably get a smaller crop. So that's my top tip. Also, I don't plant shop-bought garlic, so I wouldn't go to the supermarket and plant that particular variety because some of them may be grown in Greece and or all over the world and you know you want something that's going to be acclimatized to your soil so I like to get mine from the garlic farm in the Isle of Wight it's my favorite place and I love the history of the garlic farm as well the garlic was brought over in the war to be protected um, so it's really nice to be a part of that story and bring that into your own garden and you can buy it online as well um, but I haven't bought garlic actually for probably about the last four years because I just keep replanting it and then those garlic cloves get more acclimatized to your particular soil um, the other one that I really like to grow is elephant garlic slightly more delicate flavor not as potent but beautiful whopping great big cloves so keep your eyes peeled if you can find that in the garden centers have a little look and give it a go because there's nothing like but pulling these giant bulbs of garlic out of the ground. So those are my top tips for growing garlic this year. But have a little look around at all the different varieties and also make sure you check out whether you're going to grow a soft neck or a hard neck because if you want that storage life go for that soft neck variety so that's my top tip for this um this month i'm really looking forward to talking about broad beans and some other vegetables over the next few months thank you again to the plant-based podcast for having me there's nothing i love more than chatting veg and check out my instagram august garden and if you want to chat veg come and have a little um chat with me but thanks again and i look forward to chatting to you again soon oh my gosh this is so exciting talking to you about this it does it oh. makes me feel really excited and also yeah. your passion is like clearly coming through as well like you're obviously so passionate about the project and plants in general and um, what I would love to know is that when um you know a new plant is introduced uh to here in the UK do you know of any that first of all haven't worked or that haven't quite made the journey for any reason and I can only assume that some of these expeditions uh were pretty perilous as well you know yeah absolutely but um, I think we need to turn that on its head almost which is that for hundreds of years most plants didn't make it back mm-hmm. because bringing back live plant material was so incredibly difficult. Oh, so yeah. even if you could get the seeds and get there at the right time, collect the seeds, well, how do you get them back? Um, so seed was sent back packed in sand or soil or moss or even tubs of dripping. Um, right. I mean, for example, the first rhododendron seeds to make it back to Europe were sent from a garden in Calcutta by um, a bloke called Nathaniel Wellick, and he packed them in tins of brown sugar seem to work very well wow Uh, but so uh, um there's a letter um written to the royal horticultural society i think in 1819 by um a surgeon living in in macau working for the east india company and he says at this point that only one in every thousand plants make it back Mm -hmm. one in every perish on route and that is so you know he has a, he fixes a price to it so that the, you know the cost per plant goes up from six and eight pence old money uh, to 300 quid a plant and you know wouldn't it be a good idea to send a gardener to look after these plants anyway they don't do that so it's not until the invention of the wardian case uh, in 1833 uh, does is there any kind of reliable way of transporting plants and the wardian case you don't know it's like a terrarium it's a little closed ecosystem and if you think how perilous those journeys were that lasted you know six months through with 
sea washing over them, boiling hot at some of the journey, freezing cold for some of the journey, and then the crew don't like it because they're taking valuable water, and the, if yeah. they, you know, they pitch, they make the things wrong. So they're the first things overboard if anything's in trouble. So it, 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 for ages and ages, you know, for all those years, plants didn't make it back. And then that's not to mention, so those are the ones that get as far as being shipped, um, but, you know, all the plants that got lost in accidents, because mm-hmm. um, they had a lot of accidents, uh, these people, or, you know, poor old Douglas, um, you know, his, he was always crashing his canoe into rocks and losing the lot. <laughs> and, or even in extreme, when he had, you know, when he'd been wandering around the North Pacific forest for several days, and all he had to eat was his seeds. So, um, oh, wow. he ate them. So... <laughs> And this this happened. Um, well, if it didn't look the court fire. <laughs> what? Yeah, you know, if you find something that you think is new, I think but, you need food. You take the risk. But, <laughs> like, what if it was poisonous or something? Oh uh, well. Oh, did any plant hunters die from <laughs> eating a sea well, you shouldn't have? But you know, uh, to talk about eating, I mean, one of the most amazing stories I found about was about not eating, which. Um, um, Vavilov, who um, Nikolai Vavilov, who's a um, Russian scientist gen- geneticist, um, was trying to um, gather crops that he kept in a seed bank in Leningrad, and um, he he fell on the wrong side of Stalin, so he'd been locked up by then. But his <laughs> obsessions were all um, in. In a seed bank in Leningrad, and his, as you know, Leningrad was um, under siege um, for a prolonged period, and I don't know how million people died. Um, but these scientists kept these accessions and did not eat them. So uh-huh. the man who was in charge of rice died of starvation. Really? Yes. Surrounded by packets of rice. Mm. Oh my gosh! Mm. Wow. So, yeah, that's incredible. Well, I think your book is incredible. I can't wait to receive my copy. But it covers so much in there. So we're going to actually kind of put you on the spot a little bit and ask you a few of the different plants that kind of suit various different categories. So we're going to run through those botanical discoveries. So we're going to talk about plants that have shaped empires. Plants that have affected economies in a big way as well. Plants that have changed medicine. And also plants that have advanced our understanding of science. So if you don't mind here, Amber, can we look at each one of those and give us kind of what you think is the kind of ultimate example? So first up, we've got a plant that has really shaped an empire. What would that well, example be? You know what? I'm going to cheat here. Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you about and one look in your own book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you about one plant that does all of that, Ooh. all those things, yeah. which is Cinchona, from which is derived quinine. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, the source, what's extraordinary, you know, the source of Cinchona is South America. So it's Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, mm-hmm. Bolivia. And the ironic thing is that malaria was introduced into South America by the European settlers. Mm-hmm. It, it didn't exist there before. So we first hear of Cinchona being, uh, it gets its name from, from the um, Marquesa de Cinchona, I suppose. I don't know, my Spanish, I don't know how to pronounce it. Anyway, the, a, a, um, the Viceroy's wife was supposed to be dying of malaria until she was given this, this um, folk remedy from which she made a miraculous discovery and the story goes that she took it back to Spain and to you know for the betterment of her countrymen um this isn't in fact true because she never made it back to Spain but anyway but this this was known by priests working in um Jesuits working in, in in South America and these things did come home so one of the first things that happens is that this remedy gets known um so for example um one of the ways small way it affects history is that Oliver Cromwell gets malaria 
he won't take this brew mm -hmm. uh, because it's been sent to Europe by nasty popish priests. So mm -hmm. it must be intrinsically evil. So he won't he won't try this this remedy. So he dies of malaria. Whereas Charles II has had a remedy um, recommended by his cousin Louis the Fourteenth, and he does. So he survives. So here we may maybe this has affected the course of British history. In a wow. Story. So that's a little that's a little side thing. But obviously, the big way that Cinchona affects history is that it allows the imperial expansion in the 18th and 19th centuries into tropical areas. So, you know, the, the expansion of the, the English, the French, the Dutch, the Belgian empires into new areas. And um, this is done by essentially thieving it from South America because the um, the South American country, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, all maintain very tight restrictions, maintain a monopoly on the export of um, cinchona bark. And so this one, un, you know, unlike tea that wasn't really smuggled out of China, this one is smuggled out by various people in various missions, some more successful than, than others. And the great British collector is, is a bloke called Richard Spruce, who poor chap has to find his way across Ecuador in the middle of a revolution in 1858 to 1860 and manages to get um, do a deal with some local growers and, and get some seedlings out. And these in turn, it gets sent to Kew and then from Kew it gets sent to India and, and so on. But it's not really hugely successful. So it's actually a later mission by um, a failed alpaca farmer mm -hmm. uh, decides he's going to make his fortune by um, getting some of this cinchona and he gets a specially good version and he tries to sell it to Q who by this time have said that no we're not interested so he's got the best cinchona ever and he ends up selling it sort of cut price to a Dutch farmer and it gets introduced to Java mm -hmm. and there it flourishes and that corners the whole global market which causes the collapse of the market in South America oh my gosh mm -hmm. right so and they don't really get any economic advantage from this until right into the Second World War when Java is under Japanese control and so supplies have been cut so they begin to produce some more again and so yes you know obviously it's affected the course of empire and it and it's had a massive mm. effect on on economies in terms of medicine I I certainly don't understand I'm not sure that anyone quite understands even now how exactly it works because the active ingredient wasn't identified until the 1820s and um, but i think it what it does is it causes a malarial parasite to sort of poison itself mm -hmm. um I'm not, I'm not a doctor i don't know how but <laughs> what's interesting is that um obviously since then you know there's been um the development of uh, synthetic quinine but as the um, malarial mosquitoes are now developing resistance to it, um, it seems that um, cinchona may be in demand again. Wow. So it may, in that way, cause you know an economic revival. It is to be hoped. Wow. Isn't that great? Like plants are politically charged, wow. aren't they? Seriously. Absolutely. Amazing answer. Thank you. You ticked all four boxes there. You really did. <laughs> That's so incredible. Wow. Um, I'm I'm really thoroughly like entertained and kind of really amazed at how plant hunters have kind of traveled the world, they've put themselves in probably very dangerous situations sometimes. Um, plants are obviously very much political 
and just how they've really shaped the world because man has kind of come in and decided mm. where they want to and send them their their money potential. and yeah. yeah all these kind of different mm. things i find that absolutely fascinating um, and we talk about a plant hunter as someone who is um probably someone who's botanically trained and you know it spends a lot of their life going out and about adventuring and and trying to find new plants but do you think that there is a any potential for someone like me at home to discover a new plant? <laughs> well, new sports, new versions of plants occur all the time. Isn't it? That's how we get, you know, the new varieties that um, are winning, you know, winning medals at Chelsea, that we get new yeah. versions of things. So, you know, th- that's how they come about very often by chance. Ob- yeah, obviously, people do hybridise them to, deliberately, which is you know, what happens next to the plant when the plant hunt has brought it home. But, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, there's always, there are always going to be new sports. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, that very famous poppy, um, Patty's Plum. Yeah, this was coming yeah, from. You know, that, that was that was just a, a chance thing in a in a Somerset garden, and yeah, there's all sorts of uh, opportunities uh, and kind of examples from my time at Thompson and Morgan, like the star shaped petunias. Kind of, we were creating plants as well. I can teach you one day, Ellen, how to cross pollinate a verbascum. Thank you so you much. You can make your own oh, colours there. Yeah. That was my very first job. The first one. <laughs> 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 you have a little soft badger brushes. Yeah, absolutely. I want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but that brings us quite nicely to kind of a question that is really what areas in the world is there still potential for unexplored plants and how would we then go about exploring those areas because you know the world isn't the way it was all of those centuries ago is it still appropriate to find new plants and to find uses from those plants what where where do we kind of go from here what else is there to discover potentially well I I was very interested talking to some of the the Q people working in West Africa Mm-hmm. And um, you know, partly because of the hangover of co- from colonialism, partly because of political unrest, the the sort of botanical establishments in in those countries are very underdeveloped. Mm-hmm. So a lot of work is is going into trying to build up you know botanical knowledge, botanical resources. I mean, some countries didn't even have their own herbaria, which is like the starting point for this. So um, I mean, clearly there's there's a, a massive areas that have not still been explored. So massive geographical areas and that, you know, by making collaborations, um, you know, across the world, um, these these are, you know, things that um, can can be developed. And the other thing, you know, another thing I found interesting was that um, talking to Bledon Wynne Jones at at Krug Farm said uh, that how he became aware that there were certain genera that were really very underexplored. So that he would go to new places. And you know, when he was talking to me in the context of going to sort of Taiwan and Vietnam and so on, and said, well, you know, there are all these places growing perhaps in more montane areas um, where, where you know we know, for example, about I don't know, say nine types of hydrangea that are in common cultivation, but there are lots and lots and lots of other ones that could equally prove promising that no one's particularly paid a, attention to yet. Um, and again, you look at someone like Mikinori Ogisu, you know, that the, the number of epimediums he's introduced really from quite a relatively small geographical area. So that, you know, there's, there's clearly much to be found. And um, obviously the, the, you know, the great thing is that things can be found and documented and understood in um, in much more sustainable ways, you know, through mm-hmm. the use of digital photography and because of you know the the very necessary controls mm-hmm. that um, exist now to um, control the movement of plants. Um, so, um, you know, think, yeah, there's there. potential. What controls are there, just so our listeners are kind of clear? It's not like you can just rock up in Taiwan, take a hydrangea from the wild and then no, start... You absolutely no, you so need, what is really the correct process? Yeah. Um, there, basically, there, there, there's a um, CITES um, mm-hmm. controls the, the, the movement of plants. Um, I mean, this is slightly controversial in so far as it's been suggested that 
uh, it can have unintended consequences because it can uh, prevent the removal of plants from a country whereas sometimes you know something that's been pointed out over and over again it if a plant is under threat in its native habitat as many species are particularly from you know from logging from creating palm oil plantations mm -hmm. um hydroelectric projects whatever um the best way to preserve them is to spread them about as as widely as possible but clearly mm -hmm. that still needs to be done under very um controlled circumstances so you can get this um you know, it's been put to me that you can get this slightly bizarre situation where you know it, it's not legal to export uh an orchid from a threatened area but you can go in as a developer and i mean how can you say you can know a developer's going to go in and clear this area burn it build something on it whatever 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 and it's not legal to remove your orchids from that area mm -hmm. um before they do that mm -hmm. but it is legal then to go in and destroy them all mm -hmm. isn't that interesting mm -hmm. oh my gosh um <laughs> So, so you know, it's a very, it's, you know, it's, it's quite a contentious, contentious mm -hmm. area. So, um, but still, I think you know, the, the message is that there's, there's so much out there still to be found. Yeah. Um, we kind yeah. of need to crack on before it's all lost. Yeah, because uh, um, I, I, I guess that some species will be lost before they're even found, yeah, you know, yeah. at the rate that things are changing. And that's <clears throat> really devastating to think about. This has given me so much food for thought. Mm. It's been so, so interesting. And I cannot wait to read the book. I really can't. So thank you so much yeah, for spending you. your lockdown days writing it. <laughs> 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 We've really appreciated you coming on to the podcast. It's been so enjoyable. Yeah, thank you so much amber really we we could talk for hours we really could, we could and i know our listeners will really enjoy <laughs> this one as well so thank you very much and uh, for anybody who would like to purchase the book it's called um the plant atlas um plant hunters atlas and um yeah you will want it just from the cover let alone what's inside <laughs> <laughs> cool thank you very much thank, amber. thank we'll you <laughs> Hello, I'm called Teddy and I like gardening. A one minute gardener and I like soiling and I like playing with my toys. I sure. <laughs> and so when you're on the allotment, do you want to tell us about the soil? Because most people won't know that a three-year-old boy knows all about soil, but you do. Mm -hmm. So what's under the ground? Bugs. Bugs. And uh, cats. Bugs and, well, I don't think there's cats, but there are bugs and worms. <laughs> and what do they do with and the soil? Moles. And moles, you do, but not in Ireland. No. No. Only in England. Yeah. Dougie lives in England. Hey, Dougie on BBC, yeah? yeah? Yeah. And he tells you all about roots, didn't he? Yeah. Hey, Dougie taught you about roots and trees. And what are roots like? Um, Like trees. They're under the trees. And do they help? How do they get the water into the tree? Um, Little bugs get it. And that makes the tree very in Interesting. Very interesting, it does. There are the roots like straws. Is that what you told me before? Yeah. Yeah. And the bugs in the soil, they break up all the carbon and organic stuff we put in the ground, like our compost. Mm. But how do we make compost? With soil. No, no, what do we put in the compost bin? Soil. Now we take soil out of the compost bin, but do you put in your bananas? Multi plants. Multi plants. <laughs> plants. Plants. Yeah. Well, mouldy plants. Yeah. Yeah. And drinks. And drinks. Do you put in some food that we don't eat anymore? Mm -hmm. Do you remember all the apple juice you made last weekend? You put a bucket of crushed up apples in. 
And that's all becoming soil to put around our trees and our plants. And the bugs, they'll eat up all that food and break it down and release some good stuff into the trees, don't they? Yeah. So rather than sending it off with the bin trucks, people should compost more, should they? No. No? Yeah. Yeah, you're just messing. Well, that's very clever, isn't it, Teddy? I had so many snogs, bugs. You had so many? Snogs. Snogs? What's the... Do you mean frog spawn? No. no. Snugs. Slugs. Okay. So, do you have any questions for Ellen, Mary and Mr. Plankeek this week? No. Because you told me your name was Plankeek. No, I have a badge up there. You have a badge? Oh, he's gone to find his badge, people. It's okay, Teddy, you can come back. <laughs> Mr. Plankeek won't be annoyed that you're not wearing his badge right now. Do you think they'd like to come pick some flowers, Teddy? Nope, not there. It's not anywhere. It's not anywhere. What did you want to ask Ellen Mary, Teddy? Okay. I think we're a bit distracted now because he's looking at all his different badges. He's got one with the house from up on it. Should we say goodbye to everyone, Teddy? Uh, yeah. No. Come on, nope. Mary. Oh, that's nice. Do you think she would? Uh-huh. Should we say come any time you want? Come any time you want. When she's back in England. When you're back in England. Bye. Thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Series 5 is sponsored by the team at Always Cal and Chewy. They're the experts when it comes to this super cool house plant. Why not visit callanchoey.nl or follow Always Callanchoey on Instagram to find out more. Hey Ellen, morning. Hi, how are you? Hi. <laughs> That's how we always start our gossip. Hey, hi, how you doing? What are you up to? Keep it nice formal. To Oh. Um, yeah, so you're in the swing of things in the US now. I see that you're still in your cupboard, aka closet. Yeah, um, it looks closet. lovely. You've got my favorite light switch in there as well. Yeah. And you've got some shoes precariously balanced above your head. Well, they're in, they're in a shoe rack thing. Yeah. You know, where they're like hanging because it's only a small closet. So we've had to kind of put things, sort things out where, you know, small space kind of. You have to throw of. some clothes out. Dare I say this, but like decluttering. Yeah. Uh huh. Marie I'm Kondo. No, I'm no Marie Kondo. Absolutely. <laughs> believe me. But uh, yeah, I have had to send some clothes to charity and whatnot. But the clothes yeah. are great. Soundproofing in the closet to record. Uh, I guess you'd have some stuff there. Were you. Um... Because I used to have like, well, I've still got clothes sitting in China in an apartment, but like you would have some stuff there. And then would you be looking sometimes like back in UK and thinking, oh, where's that? Where's that yeah. blouse? Yeah, all of the time. Like, and I, yeah. if I'm going somewhere, I think, oh, just put that jacket on. Oh, it's not here. Yeah. I know. I've got the same okay. problem with a leopard skin shirt at the moment. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's definitely in China. And, you know, you can't get and into I'm China. And I'm very really adverse to buying two shirt. of the same thing. Yeah, I know. I should look on ASOS, actually. Oh, I might fire it up while you're here. It's not like I'm paying attention to this, is it? Isn't that just charming? Tell me some gardening news anyway. Like, Because obviously I see your garden quite a lot in person, lucky me. But what's mm-hmm. going on now? Now I'm not there. Oh, do you know what, Ellen? It's the end of the season. And like my garden looks hungover. And <laughs> no, But do you know when the garden just looks hungover and it's just like, oh, my God, we're done. Like they had a bloody good night. <laughs> I love yeah, that. And I haven't even, I know, oh God, this is going to sound so ungrateful, but because it's then cooling off and stuff, and I haven't really bothered to go out there because it hasn't been sunny. So I'm kind of a bit, and I need to, I've been so busy last few weeks and this week I've been really kind of desk bound, but I really need to have a big tidy up of like the garage, the garden, like there's, you know, stuff that's tumbled over everywhere. And yeah, and I'm not really a good person at 
doing stuff as I go. I right. wait until it's all um, kind of, uh, what do you call it, apocalyptic until <laughs> I don't go and tidy it. So I'm kind of like, because I feel like that's a better use of my time, you know, do it all in one. But that means that, you know, the world has nearly ended by the time I tidy my garage, you know. <laughs> but that's just me, Ellen. <laughs> There's got to be some drama in between, hasn't there? I know. But, you know, I'm a busy girl. I'm a girl on the go. <laughs> you really are. Have you been to my allotment yet? No, am I supposed to? When when do I have to go? Well, there's chickpeas for you to harvest. There's blue but pumpkins when? When? for you to harvest. I uh, have to put it in my dairy diary. Yeah, whenever you want to. But um, the chickpeas, generally, the plants have to kind of be yellow, brown, and the pods yeah. yellow before you harvest them. But that will be any time now, especially if the weather hasn't been that good in England. Um there's some blue pumpkins. <laughs> there's some blue pumpkins you can harvest, and there's also some speckled swan gourds for you to harvest as well. Oh, which that's cool. cool. Oh, I can decorate those for Christmas or Halloween yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's plenty there. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about, really. There's yeah. plenty there. So yeah. Uh-huh. Very good. What about your house plants? Uh, the house plants here are all doing fine. They're not like, there they're in in Norfolk, you will. Uh, well, they're being looked after by friends. Uh, so I watered them before I came away and then someone's going in every 10 days to two weeks just to check okay. in on them. Well, I'll go in every week and so they get nicely watered. <laughs> 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 uh, but you know what? It's winter, so they're not going to need much at all, are they? So No, no. And I left darling. like... The garden at the end of the day will get sorted when I get back in spring. But I tidied it all up. There's not much else I could do. You know, mm. I came away much earlier than I would usually. Uh, so it is what it is. It'll be fine. And like you, I'll get back and I'll do it all in one go because I can't do it every day. I um, know. I know. It'll That's be the fine. Thing. Yeah, is what yeah. it is, you know. Gardening is amazing and enjoyable and I love it. But equally, I can't do it you know, on a daily yeah, basis. Yeah, but you know what, you say that, but I think gardening in August and September is never enjoyable, really. Because <laughs> I, I think remember? by that time, we're all a bit tired out, you know? Yeah, you it's know? like, so if you have an allotment, August is really all about the harvests, and then September... Yeah, but too harvest. much harvest, isn't it? I've seen you lot, like, you you and courgettes, you know? Do you know what? It really annoys me because I have always grown so many, and then I, yeah. this year I was like, I'm only going to grow two, and I grew two and I had as many courgettes off those two as I did when I had planted out loads of courgettes really? before. It, they never, ever bloom and ended. Like, enough is enough. So next year, I'm going to have one courgette plant and that's yeah. it. But that's uh, the fail safe. It would be great if somebody bred a courgette that fruited less. Yeah, I, <laughs> I actually agree. I really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. If you had like you know five to ten throughout the whole year on one plant yeah. you really don't need any more than that i don't think oh. personally so yeah i had a lot of harvest and also it's like i was on my own a lot this year obviously because of travel and covid mm-hmm. and whatnot so it was too much veg and i was giving it away and i couldn't even <laughs> give it away in the end so yeah. next year is going to be very different on that allotment that's for sure but you did bring me a manky old bag of loads of beans one time <laughs> They're not manky. Oh, were they? The I have bit- dried them very meticulously. I even bought Soybean. a special dryer. Yeah. Oh, that's a ma- and also once you've dried them, go to. Uh, oh, do they need to be dried? I don't know. Anyway, go to uh, So Vegan, So mm-hmm. Vegan in Five. They wrote a book. They're on Facebook, and they have this really cool and so simple recipe to make uh, your own tofu with the soybeans. Oh wow! Yeah, and dried. And- I can't, that's what I'm saying. Now I can't I remember. Just, just, you just rehydrate them, don't you? I guess. I think so. I yeah, think yeah. so. And it was. It looks super easy. And if I can get some soybeans here, I'm going to give it a go. It looks really, really cool. Uh-huh. So if you've oh, got enough, cool. you might be able to do that. Ella Mary, that's lovely. It's a total pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> can I tell you what I'm going to be doing this weekend? I really want to tell you because I'm really excited. Oh. And I, I know we that. We I know you. <laughs> oh, I know you'll be pleased about it, and I know you'll yeah. be pleased for me, but also I think that you're going to be, like, a little bit jealous. <laughs> so, since, <laughs> since I got back, I've done nothing but work. It's been a really, really busy yeah. time. So we decided to have a couple of days and head over to the coast in North Carolina to a place called yeah. Wilmington. And uh, 
there's a 70 mile radius around Wilmington where you can find native carnivorous plants. And it's the only place in the world where they grow in the wild as natives. Mm-hmm. And we're going to go <coughs> plant hunting. I'm going plant hunting for carnivorous plants and I may not sleep well tonight. <laughs> I think you're going to scream when you see them because when I was in the Welsh mountains and I saw sundew for the first time, yeah. it was such a moment to see a plant like that wild. It's just, yeah. oh my God. I know. Oh, really, really spy really traps. I've been writing about them literally yesterday, actually. Yeah. And I picked up one at B&Q and it's like, it, and it was almost like, was it serendipitous? I'm not sure. But anyway, it was on my desk as I was writing about it. And I I was downstairs and there was a spider and Oh no, it sounds awful. But I took the spider upstairs to do some experiments. <laughs> and so the spider was then in the room with me and it just so happened to run across the just, a fly trap. It yeah. just so happened to run across the Oh my god, it's just fly such trap. an incredible plant. It's just incredible. Oh my god, Ellen. That brings me around to we've got a few new little features that we're inserting into our gossips. And the first one is gonna be our plant of the week. So, Ella Mary, what is your plant of the week? Because I know you're on a new balcony, but are there any plants that have really caught your eye over the last couple of weeks since you've been in the US of A? Right. To be honest with you, there are tons. There are tons. This is a really difficult one to pick. But actually, I'm going to pick one that you will know. And I know people do know, but I don't think we use it as much as we should do. And Mm -hmm. it's the Society Garlic. Oh, nice one. Bagia violacea. It flowers on and on and on. In the Mm. UK, you can grow it. In the US, you can grow it. Hummingbirds really love it in the US. It's a social plant. You can eat it like it's garlic. It's a bit oniony, but it doesn't leave the taste and smell in your mouth. Hence why it's called society garlic. And that's my plant of the week. (laughs) Because don't the... I think the leaves smell of like garlic, but don't the flowers taste sweet or something? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah the yeah. whole plant is edible, but mm. it just doesn't leave that smell in your mouth after you've had yeah, it. Yeah, that's it's cool. Edible. And there's a lot of new varieties as well. That's nice. Yeah. And we don't but, grow it as much as we should. So, uh, my plant of the week is perhaps a little bit predictable, I have to say. It's the Circus Eternal Flame, which was plant of the year at Chelsea Flower Show. And I have to say incredible smug face here in my pink lounge i managed to get it on tv before the bbc have to say (laughs) because they filmed the bbc uh on the monday but they didn't put it out till the friday and i'd like whipped in in the middle and got it on steph's pat lunch on the thursday and then i took it back to tv on gb news on the saturday and i had a live um what's called it sample next to me in my kitchen and i Dragged it onto camera. I was like, you're coming on. Hello. <laughs> in our lovely eternal f- flame circus, which is a really cool plant. The ombre effect. Oh, my God, Ellen. And I have to say, on Instagram, it was a 2,000 liker. Woo! You don't I... get a 2,000 liker without showing nipples these days, I tell you. That's some plant, right? It is really Hello. beautiful. The colours are lovely. We have quite a lot of circus, circus around here where I live in North Carolina, oh. and you can't beat that beautiful change of colour in the leaves along the stem. It's stunning. Mm. And that is a really gorgeous plant. So well done. Yeah, you yeah, getting it on TV before the BBC. So there we go. That is our plant of the week. Yeah, Ellen. So I hope you have a lovely plant hunt. Yeah. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to it. I've got. Will there to be say, alligators? No, not where we're going. There won't oh. be. Well, I hope there won't be. No, I don't. Think <laughs> yeah, you do, don't you? <laughs> I don't think there are. I don't think there are. So yeah, oh I get me. I'm a plant hunter. <laughs> oh, oh my lord! So what else <laughs> are you going to do while you're there? Are you going on any more little trips like that, or what? Or oh well, yeah, what about we'll autumn colour? That would be good to see somewhere. Where sorry? Autumn colour. Oh, yeah, we're going up through Virginia up to mm. Philadelphia. So we're going to Longwood in a couple of weeks. Longwood. Oh, Garden. I've been there. I love it. And oh, then uh, up to Washington. Cool. So that we're trying to time it because last year I got here at the end of October. We yeah. went straight up through Virginia to see the autumn colour that literally that weekend, but I'd missed it by about seven days. Yeah. So this year we tracked, you, there's actually a tracker online oh, really? where the autumn colour is across the states. And so cool. we're timing it, hopefully, to put, 
to perfection to drive up through the um, Blue Ridge Park, um, Parkway to see all of the different yeah. colours and up through Virginia. Um, yeah, we've got quite a lot planned, actually. We're going to do quite a lot of travelling. We're going to go over onto the West Coast a little bit as well and hopefully uh, we even might have uh, a nice kind of Christmassy trip somewhere hot and sunny as well so yeah oh well that all sounds rather racy (laughs) yeah racy what about you what are you up to over the next week or so uh I don't know because I really came to the end of like summer and the big busy working period and I'm kind of like just I feel like um you know when you go down a road like usually a road in Greece that is like tarmac and then suddenly you get to the end of the tarmac and you're on this like rough ground and in a desolate place and that's how <laughs> I feel at the moment because <laughs> I've been so busy and I'm just like I think I'm I'm really tired out Ellen Mary I tell you and like I've just had a few days off so I think hopefully that's gonna like uh regenerate me but it's it's also the end of the season and the change of the season and kind of then getting used to it then being darker and like oh my god I hate that rubbish where you have to have the heating on you know that's <laughs> such a oh my god and you know i don't need the heating on as much as my partner does so then i don't want to have the heating on and then i <laughs> and i hate that you know when like in the in the autumn and the winter where you you can't really you feel like you're oh how to describe it you know when you feel like you're not in the room because it's just like everything's like then hot and like dark and a lot of people find that cozy but i find it really like horrible <laughs> I'm really confused. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just hate it. It's like the opposite of Hugo, you know. <laughs> oh, I, I don't like that kind of like closed kind of vibe. I like to be out, vibrancy, lots of light, stuff like that. So yeah. I think you have to try and take the positives to both sides. Like I love. I guess being yeah, outside. I need to embrace it. How do I do that then? You know, I love being outside. Uh, you know, out in the air, like you said, all the vibrancy and color and fresh mm. air and light. But actually, being cozy indoors gives you opportunity to put your feet up, recharge yourself, yeah. watch I some. I think probably the adjust- adjustment time that yeah. kind of September, October, yeah. like exactly. You wish it was still summer. You're not ready to embrace autumn. You kind of yeah. I don't know, but that that'd be cool. Um, we've got Steph's pack lunch every couple of weeks as well. Obviously, I should appreciate this downtime because I've got a bloody book to write, haven't I? So yeah. yeah, this is the time that I need to do that because I tell you, Ellen, and I think you know this as well. Trying to write books in hotel rooms in snippets of time is just it's hard work, isn't it? You yeah, just it need doesn't to be work. At home in a lovely environment, ideally not in the bath, and just work mm-hmm. at it. That's the thing. I always so, yeah. find that just sitting and writing, even if it's for the whole day, is much more productive than just trying to fit in half an hour or an hour yeah, here. No, yeah, totally. It doesn't work for me either. Yeah. So, yeah, and also I found that I couldn't be like randomly in a hotel room because if I'm in a hotel room, I'm in another place. And so I will want to explore that place. Yeah. I think the only place that would work is if you booked out a hotel by the side of the motorway. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then you wouldn't want to go and explore, would you? That could be a True. good solution. True. No, oh. I'm, I'm with you. Be at home, sit down, be comfortable. And also, if you don't have this time out period, you'll burn yeah. out. You know? Yeah, no, you're we've right. Both, we've both said how exhausted we feel after the year that we've had. And so it's actually quite nice to chill out. So just, you know, take the time to, to rest yeah. your mind and body a bit, you know? Well, do you know, Ellen, talking of burnout, this is time for another new section on The Gossip plant fail of the week you go first all right so ellen my plant fail of the week oh my gosh i i didn't oh there's my alarm going off for no apparent reason um (laughs) i didn't really practice what i preach in the garden this season because i randomly bought some bulbs just off amazon i bought some spiraxis which i haven't seen hide nor hair of i don't know what hide nor hair of means but anyway um (laughs) Tigridia have been good value, I will admit that, but I had some gladioli that haven't given me any damn blooms, and I wanted some orange gladioli amongst my purples. What was the other thing? Oh, Galtonia were a waste of time. Acidemphira, they barely flowered, but I wonder if they were a little bit too dry. But I just, I bought some bulbs of not good provenance and couldn't be sure if they were flowering size or this or that, so kind of... I would say my plant fail of the week, perhaps my plant fail of the season, is really bad quality bulbs. Don't do it, (laughs) kids. Don't do it, kids. And don't set your alarm for apparently no reason. Right, Ellen, what is your fail of the week? 
My fail of the week is to do with the dreaded mealybugs. So just before I came away to the US, I found some mealybugs on my Hoya Bella, which is one of my favorite plants. And I cried a bit and I cleaned it all up. And I was super upset because obviously you really need to keep on top of them and I'm not going to be there every day you know to do that so it's it's kind of stressful but then you come away and it's like well i'm away now there's nothing much i can do about it and then i was checking over some of the plants on the balcony and there's a couple of majesty plums or majestic palms however you want to uh call them um uh ravinia rivularis Mm -hmm. and my hubby had bought them and they're standing on the balcony and I went to repot them and they're covered in mealybugs. Oh. So my plant fail is basically being able to control mealybugs transatlantic. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had mealybugs. Oh my God. Oh. So annoying. Mm, but I think I'm very, I'm very cutthroat with my plants because, you know, as you know, a lot of my plants are like leftovers from like different TV stints and stuff. So it's like, it's... I'm very kind of like if if something's looking a little bit sad, then it's going straight on the compost. I've really got no, yeah. so I probably I don't even notice when they've got like bugs because I've thrown them out before they've got the bugs, perhaps. Which yeah. I, but I, these I like should feel guilty about. I don't know. But. I do, I am pretty ruthless as well. Yeah. But the Hoya Bella back in the UK is one of my favourite plants. It yeah. literally flowered when I got back in March, and it didn't stop flowering till I came. Oh, to welcome you. It was um, it's amazing and <laughs> smells beautiful, looks beautiful, and then. The palms here on the balcony are big, you know, yeah. and so I always feel bad about throwing big plants away for some reason. And uh, I'm going to try and treat them with rubbing alcohol and water solution. Mm-hmm. And if not, then they're going to go in the bin. Yeah. Yeah. So me. Oh, well, sorry about that. Plant fail of the week. <laughs> Ellen, you mung bean. <laughs> What's going on? Look, look at this, look at this, look at this. Underwater houseplants, next big thing. Yeah, they're cute. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's cute. And the water does look manky yet, actually. So that's nice. I put okay. some uh, Lysomachia in there, you know, the Creeping Jenny. Yeah. That's Did really you funny you said that. I actually, I've got some Creeping Jenny in one of the pots on the balcony. Yeah. And I just divided it and I put some yeah. into another pot because I love how it grows. Yeah. And uh, that all died. I should have included that in the plant fail of the week. <laughs> oh, <damn it. laughs> But I often see it used as a kind of underwater plant. So that's why I've wazzed it in there. Yeah. yeah. Strange, wazzed but... it in. I like it. Oh. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah. So it's all going on, Ellen. And it is. we're knee deep into series five. We've got our sponsor, Always Cal and Cherry, as well, who is yeah. our sponsor up to mid November. And then we've got a special kind of more Christmassy kind of gift sponsor, haven't we? So we're we're splitting things up a little bit this season. Lots of really cool things to come. Obviously, we'll be doing a few cool reels as well. You might have seen our reels on the Pink Kisses uh, Instagram channel, actually. There's a really cool one there, actually, where I tried to entice you with all sorts of gifts and nothing works until... <laughs> until there's some pink kisses. It's all good. <laughs> and um, the Cal and Cherry as well, I must just say, it's probably one of the first houseplants I think I ever had. Yeah, I think probably the same for me. And I remember from my grandma, like this lovely, lovely red single flowered one. And do you know what, Ellen? They, they're they really good value because mm-hmm. once they finish flowering, just like an orchid, just kind of forget about them. Just yeah. like almost abandon them. And they will bounce back. And I had mine in an outdoor patio basket. And they then, they surprised me at the end of the summer because I literally just dumped them out there and I was like, oh, I'm over you now. (laughs) And they then went on to flower for weeks and weeks and weeks. And they came back almost like this second layer below the blooms that had already spent. It was incredible, Ellen. That's right. They're They're really good. Just all of the colours. I actually left one on my uh, mantelpiece in the UK, which is like a, it's Mm -hmm. whitey but off pinky as well it's so so pretty and i'd okay. never have to do anything to it you yeah. know I, it's just it is there it's what it is it grows it looks gorgeous and so yeah i'm super happy to have a always cal and cherry on plant-based podcast defo <laughs> well it's been super lovely chatting with you michael oh you too actually i think what's what's really funny is last week and also this week we're both like 
in this kind of like zone of like semi exhaustion. <laughs> we kind of hear what we're talking, but we're not sure we're even talking. So I'm really <laughs> pleased that our interviews were pre recorded. Oh, and this yeah. is the only bit that is nearer to live because really, we are the end of the season and we are S P E N T. 100%. Spent one. <laughs> spent spent out but we do have cool. some excellent episodes thankfully so uh, all is well and you can hear us gossiping on the next episode as well hopefully we've both had a little bit of a break by then and we'll be more coherent <laughs> well I've got good news to tell you Ellen Mary because the next episode will be 17th of October which is a Sunday and we've already said that that will be a plant-based podcast quiz so we better get our quiz shoes on <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be fun so join us then thank you very much for putting up with us basically leave us a five star review we will accept nothing less thank you the music for the Pompe podcast is part of the song Grow by Mikey James and our editor is Gareth Patch of Semi Echo Semi Echo